Money doesn't grow on trees. This is a statement which I think we all learn at quite a young age, and it seems the older you get, the truer it gets. And I just wanna set expectations before I begin. The TED idea I'm spreading isn't gonna change that. But when you think about that phrase, money doesn't grow on trees, it's really trying to summarize up some pretty fundamental lessons in financial management. The first is that money is scarce, or that money has value. And the second is that money has to be earned. There is value in effort. And when you think about those phrases and you think about maybe the first time you heard money doesn't grow on trees or learnt those things, you were probably quite young. And that's quite important having that knowledge because knowledge, we base our actions on what we know and we base our habits on our actions. And as Aristotle once said, good habits formed at youth make all the difference. I like to think that if he worked for the bank I work for, he would have said good financial habits formed at youth make all the difference to future financial well-being. Because the habits that we have often make us the way that we are, dealing with the small, then dealing with the big. So when you think about that phrase and habits, the two come together in how we learn, how we're taught. So for me, if I think back to when I first started to get some of those habits taught to me, it started with washing the car or mowing the lawns. I'm the eldest of seven children, so my parents knew all about cheap labour. <laughs> and what they would do is give me jobs to do, and I would, at the end of each week, get pocket money or an allowance, usually a shiny coin. I hate to think how little it was at the time. And as I got older, the jobs got more and the money got slightly bigger. But I started to realize that this, this cash, this coin had value. I could exchange it for goods and services, which when you're eight, it's pretty much comic books and candy bars. But as I got older and wanted to buy things that were more than the very meager mum and dad, very meager amount of money I got, I realized that I had to put some of the money that I had aside, some of the cash I had aside, because once the cash was spent, it was gone. So I did what generations of Kiwis have done, I put it in a money box. And the, the reason why I was doing this is because I was learning about numbers. I didn't realize that's what I was doing, I just knew that I was putting some things aside. And cash was forming this tangible bridge to an intangible concept, money. And cash works in that way because of the way we learn and teach about numbers. Oftentimes in our schools, we'll start by, with materials. Those materials might be counters or blocks that you add together in order to understand that numbers add and make a bigger number. And then the teacher, as you get a little bit more advanced, will hide some of those materials and you form images in your head. And then as you get a little bit more advanced, you start to realize that numbers have properties and you can then do more complicated things like you know, calculus, which you can never possibly imagine in your head. So cash is forming an important role in teaching about numbers. And we, we think this is important because if our children are more financially literate, then as they grow up, they become more financially literate adults, and then New Zealand as a whole benefits. And I don't need to ask too many people here about whether or not we think there's room to improve around teaching about financial education. But we're finding that some things are getting harder to teach because cash, this useful material in teaching, is also kind of inconvenient. So we're getting rid of it. Already, New Zealand has one of the lowest distributions of cash per capita in the world. And the cash that we do have, we're not even using in the same way. There are plenty of stats around, but the conservative figure would say over 80% of the daily transactions and payments that we do are not using cash. So cash is disappearing, and money, which is already an intangible concept, is actually becoming more intangible as we become more cashless. So we thought we might try and tackle this problem and tackle it not the way a bank traditionally would tackle it. Instead, we thought we would tackle it the way a tech company does. So that means things like prototyping, agile, uh, soldering, uh, and working with partners, which we did all of that, collaborated with some of the great people we have and the partners that we work with, and we built a new bridge. And this is what he looks like. He's called Clever Cash, and he's a cashless money box. But he's also 
a digital payments experience. Nice little buzzwords there. He is a cashless money box that displays and begins to form a tangible connection for children to their money. But it's also about how we update Clever Cash that is as important as the device itself. So this is the part where I start to tempt fate and I'm gonna do a demo. Kind of fingers crossed and intake of breath will be fine. So I happen to have one of the little guys here. To be more accurate, this is actually my youngest daughter's Clever Cash. Thankfully she's four so she won't be watching this. So to wake Clever Cash up, the first thing I do is the same thing that generations of Kiwis have done when they wanna know how much money is in their money box. You give it a shake. And it will wake up and display the current balance of Hannah, my youngest daughter's savings account. So I will now log into the um, mobile app the way I normally would if I was going to transfer money into Hannah's savings account. And I'm gonna put in her pocket money, so she's, like I say, four, so her pocket money's 50 cents. <laughs> Darling, if you're watching this, they're laughing because they're amazed how much money that is. But in transferring the money, it's intangible. It's gone from one account to another, and my daughter at four does not have an iPhone. So she's not aware that the money is transferred. So when I put that money in like I just did, now what I'm gonna do is transfer the money to Clever Cash. So what we see is a ceremony here of different coins, dollars, notes. They're all kind of grayed out because it's only 50 cents because I'm cheap. <laughs> and then literally I hand the phone over to my daughter and she puts the money into the money box. <laughs> so, does he work? So technically, yes, he works. But remember, the goal here is not to just create a cool money box is to try and form a new bridge between the intangible concepts of money and value into a tangible physical world. So this is Hannah, this is my daughter, and that's her putting in her pocket money last Sunday. And at four and a half, she's a pretty bright girl, but she will go straight to the 50 cents and slowly drag it off the phone and she gets a big smile on her face when Clever Cash updates. I was gonna bring her out here tonight, but it's past her bedtime. This is her older sister, Sarah. Sarah is six and a half. And Sarah gets a dollar, a dollar each week. And interesting for me, so they've been part of the pilot of the device for the last couple of months. And when she first started using Clever Cash, she'd go straight to the gold coin. My theory in that is she's been brought up on fairy tales and TV and gold's the thing you want. So she goes to the gold coin and moves it across. A couple of weeks ago, with no training or teaching from me, she slid across and went 10, 20, 30, starting to understand the money. And my wife, who's a, a, a primary school teacher, was saying, well, she's now at that point in her uh, maths at school that she's learning to count in tens. Their older brother, David, who's nine and a half, he gets $2. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but he's not allowed to spend it all at once. So for him, it's a game. So he will jump between different denominations all the time. So sometimes they might get a gift from grandparents for birthdays and it's into the notes. That's a very special occasion. But for him, it's a matter of maximizing the time with dad's iPhone. <laughs> 10 here, 20, then a 50, then a 20. So they, they are connecting to it. And in terms of it tangibly fitting into their lives, this is where I stole Clever Cash from. So it sits in Hannah's bed that she's made for him, along with some of the other dolls. So we've had a number of um, customers starting now to pilot with the device, and we're getting all sorts of feedback. And one story that I quite liked which I'm gonna try and internationalize for those viewers who are not in New Zealand. Um, the father and the son went to a local sporting event and the son asked to buy a souvenir of said sporting event. For all the Kiwis, it was the NRL nines and he wanted a tattoo sleeve. <laughs> and without Clever Cash, the model would have been something like this. Dad, I want that thing. That's okay, son, I don't have any money. That's all right, Dad, put on your card. Instead, what happened, Dad, I want that thing. Okay, son, I'll buy it for you, and then when we get home, we'll take it out of Clever Cash. Don't want it anymore, Dad. 
He had formed a connection. He'd done all this work to get the number up on Clever Cash and it was gonna go down. And he didn't wanna see that happen. So what's next? Well, for Clever Cash, we're in, like I say, pilot with customers at the moment, trying to think like a tech company. We're rolling out across the rest of the country later on this year. But in terms of what's next for forming these bridges, it's really got us thinking. Where are other examples where money being intangible is a bit of a problem? What about spending? The card example, just put it on your card. There's no sense of loss of giving something and it being taken away in order for me to get the thing I'm getting. Could we do something about that without having to rely back on the inconvenience of physical cash? What about donations? How often have you been walking along the street and a charity has been trying to collect money for their appeal and you really want to help them out, but you don't have any cash and they don't take FBOS? What about investing? Could it be that part of the reason why we have the property bubble that we have is due to Kiwis love property because it's physical and tangible. I can see it and I can touch it. But that's a lot for Clever Cash to solve, so I think we'll leave some problems for next year. Thank you.